Hello, everyone. Hello again. Um, so now we are in the second session of um, our conference, which is keynote speech or keynote lecture of Anna Singh. Uh, I already talked too much, so uh, I won't take too long. Anna Singh is the Distinguished Professor of Anthropology at University of California, Santa Cruz. Uh, and I think the theorist of globalization, environment, environment and transnational interconnection. Her books include The Mushroom at the End of the World on the Possibility of Life in Capitalist Ruins, Friction, an Ethnography of Global Connection, and In the Realm of the Diamond Queen. Her most recent work is a co-edited digital project, Feral Atlas, The More Than Human Anthropocene, which offers an original and playful ap approach to studying the Anthropocene. Her other co-edited works include Arts of Living on a Damaged Planet, Ghosts and Monsters of the Anthropocene, Words in Motion, Nature in the Global South, Shock and Awe, Communities and Conversation, and Uncertain, and Uncertain Terms. Her lecture today is titled um, the Part Particular in the Planetary, Reimagining Cosmopolitanism Beyond the Human, although I think she, she has slightly changed it, which is fine. Um, which uses her final project, collaborative project, to explore cosmopolitan assemblages that include beings other than humans. And I cannot think of a better person to keynote this conference, uh, which is the manifestation of several collaborations across various national disciplinary methodological settings, as well as genres and media. I am very happy and privileged to leave the floor to Anna for her speech. Thank you so much, Anna. It's really an honor to be here today. Uh, let me share my screen. Um, can you see it? I, I, I'll just assume that you can. Uh, it's, it's great to be part of your conference. I'm not a scholar of Istanbul, but I was inspired by your focus on the history of the city to try and experiment. I think of Istanbul as one of the most vibrantly cosmopolitan cities on the planet. So I decided to use my address to explore the concept of the cosmopolitan city more generally. How do we bring non-humans into a study of the cosmopolitan city? This is a new topic for me. And as I worked on this talk, I found it tougher going than I imagined. So I look forward to your feedback and suggestions. My exploration is organized as a series of conceptual journeys into the more than, more than human cosmopolitan city. The places I visit are drawn from a big collaborative project I've recently published together with more than 100 colleagues, Feral Atlas, the More Than Human Anthropocene. This is a digital scholarly resource, a mega book published online at feralatlas.org. When I originally accepted the assignment to speak to you, I plan to just introduce the project to you. But trying to honor your theme, I've taken this more difficult and more provisional route. Today, I'm using the Atlas as a scholarly resource, that is, as a reservoir of both analysis and raw reports that helps me analyze new problems, problems not considered directly in the framework of the Atlas. While my trip to the cosmopolitan city is exploratory, I hope you take home the idea that the Atlas can be used as inspiration for developing many research trajectories. I've picked only a few reports to mention today, but there are many. Their diversity and multiplicity encourages trying out emerging research ideas. So I hope you'll try for yourselves. As I embarked on a thought journey into the cosmopolitan city, I needed to prepare. What do I mean by the cosmopolitan city? I realized I'm not interested here in cosmopolitanism as an attribute of thinking, that is a worldly consciousness. Instead, I'm interested in urban arrangements that allow many different kinds of people and perhaps other beings as well to live together across their differences and without being forced to do so. I put cosmopolitan and city together to consider the pleasures of diversity. 
And while this is specific, I don't think I'm completely out on a limb in this focus. I've copied here what came up at the top of a Google search for cosmopolitan city. As I packed my bags to visit non-humans in the city, I needed to think about just whom I hope to meet. What kinds of non-humans can be full denizens of the cosmopolitan city? In particular, can non-humans used as tools be full denizens of the cosmopolitan city? Are my clothes, are my glasses cosmopolitan denizens? I think not. Non-humans used as tools or food or for other useful purposes help people who use them become who we are, at least as long as they're doing their jobs as they should. They're prostheses. They're not in themselves autonomous participants. It's only when they stop doing what they're supposed to do that they become autonomous beings. It's the extra things or the non-job things then. Yes, this is important for setting the terms for my exploration. The non-human denizens of the city are feral entities. Feral here just means stimulated by human remakings of the world, but not under human control. The city displaces wild beings, but it lets in feral ones. Feral entities in the human crafted space of the city are those our city making projects let loose even as they go off in their own trajectories. This is why Feral Atlas is a useful resource to think about cosmopolitan cities. Note that feral in this usage is neither positive nor negative. It's just a term that describes their relation to human infrastructures. This is not the feral of feral cities, which is a negative and sometimes racist description from urban planners. Okay, I packed for my journey. Let me show you some routes I wanted to travel. Here's my first trip, that is my thought question. How can we best disentangle the cosmopolitan nature of the city from imperialism, racial injustice, and capitalist exploitation? All the differences with which we live are infused with histories of power. Obviously, subjugation and cosmopolitan can never be fully disengaged. Still, there are gradients. We don't usually consider the imperial army bivouacked in our city to add to its cosmopolitan nature. So the first step is to imagine how closely particular feral entities of the, of the city are tied to projects of segregation, subjugation, and inequality. Not all feral non-humans, in my opinion, should be embraced as adding to the cosmopolitanism of the city. Some are more like imperial troops than friendly neighbors. Let me turn to the reservoir of stories in Feral Atlas to explore this route. Forgive me for stopping on the way to the city to visit a rural report. This story can clarify what I mean by saying that some non-humans have the force of imperial troops. Anthropologist Rosa Fiestek has studied the role of cattle and the pasture grass is imported for cattle to graze on in the European invasion of Latin America. Her article in Feral Atlas focuses on imported cattle grasses. These grasses have aggressive root systems that overwhelm forest regeneration. It's as if the grasses have their own agenda, defeating the forest. But forest ecologies have been central in the lives of indigenous as well as Afro-descendant peoples, Pushing back native ecologies also displaces human communities. Just as disease organisms helped Europeans in their conquest of the Americas by killing off so many native people, so too did cattle and grass open the way for colonial settlement and land claims. This report helps us too by refusing the divide between intentional and unintentional, which has been so powerful in structuring discussion of human action. The colonial settlers purposely cleared the forest and introduced pasture grasses for cattle. But the grasses quickly became powerful agents beyond settler plans. P6 documents this irony. Colonial smallholders who introduced pasture grasses found that their fields and their gardens were overrun by the grasses. The grasses were effective agents both with and beyond the intentions of the settlers. Rather than anchor our discussions of environmental history entirely in human consciousness, 
we need to attend to landscape patterns, as these are created by humans and non-humans. This is how we're able to move beyond the compassionate but foolhardy desire to draw all non-humans into the infectionate embrace of the cosmopolitan city. Some non-humans are shock troops within imperial projects of invasion, subjugation, and displacement. Let's wander then into the city to continue to parse out forms of imperial entanglement. Historian Michael Van's study of the French colonial remaking of the city of Hanoi is a particularly vivid example of how colonial plans can make dangerous foralities. As in North Africa, French colonialism in Indochina aimed to make beautiful modern cities for white elites. They would have broad boulevards and modern sewers, even as native peoples were crammed into crowded and rickety slums. But modern urban infrastructure has feral effects. Hanoi's colonial sewage system turned out to be an ideal place for rats, which gathered and fed there and reproduced at extraordinary rates. The sewage system was an instrument of racial segregation. Only white people were to have it. And so the city's rats, clever beasts, explored the pipes of elite white mansions crawling into toilets and bathtubs, as you see in this cartoon. This disturbance infuriated the white elite, and that's why it's in the historical record. Meanwhile, the building of roads and railways for colonial transport increased the number and variety of rats coming into the city. Rats became feral denizens of colonial cities through the infrastructures of segregation and colonial rule. Rats were not introduced by the colonizers. The urban infrastructure colonizers built created a world for rats. Again, to assess the role of non-humans in the city, it's landscape patterns, not just intentions, that matter. It's easy to jump from colonial cities to contemporary patterns of environmental injustice. In the United States, one of the most troubling patterns of racial capitalism is the placement of industrial toxins in the communities of people of color. This pattern occurs in both city and countryside, but the urban form has been of special interest to sociologist Scott Frickle, who studies brownfield toxins, that is chemical contaminants of abandoned industrial sites. In most American cities, these cluster in old downtown areas where people of color are armed also most likely to live. Residential areas are built on top of abandoned industrial sites. When storms and floods occur, the toxins spill out of the soil. Neighborhoods are contaminated without ever knowing the histories of their, of their contaminants. Racial injustice takes one of its most terrible forms in differential exposure to industrial toxins. Before we open our arms to invite every kind of non-human into the cosmopolitan city, we need to be careful to assess non-human roles in blocking livability, human and non-human. At this point, you probably think I hate all non-humans. That's not true. I just want to be careful in my assessment and to trace out lines between subjugation and ferality where they exist. But let me turn to a more benign case. Anthropologist Jacob Doherty has done research with human salvage pickers in Kampala, the capital of Uganda. On urban waste heaps, human salvage pickers are joined by flocks of marabou storks, which take advantage of the free and plentiful food. The birds have given up their long evolved migrations to become full-time residents there across seasons. Urban elites hate these birds, which they consider ugly and foul. The birds roost in trees, which most commonly are found in elite neighborhoods. They defecate on lawns and on the cars in the driveway. To elites, they are a menace. But the salvage pickers like the birds. They identify with being considered a pest by elites. They also appreciate the work of the birds, which devour huge quantities of organic matter from the dumps. This leaves the durable materials that salvage pickers want. Without the cleanup the birds offer, the work of the salvagers would be much harder. Here are allies and companions. Despite the disapproval of urban managers, Maribu Starks have joined the cosmopolitan city. Here's another one, briefly. 
Many urban water systems use chlorination to kill bacteria. But as documented by biologist Peter Funk, there are lots of tiny animals in the water, and they're not killed by chlorination just as we aren't. We swallow them every day if we drink from urban water systems. But actually, they only harm us under very particular, unusual situations. I'm willing to admit them into the cosmopolitan city. This route of exploration has been inspired in part by the kerfuffle in the academy over the concept of invasive species. Many humanists are outraged by the term. We should love all innocent beings, they argue, and they accuse natural scientists of introducing xenophobia into the city by condemning non-humans. Before going further, it's important to clarify the meaning of the term invasive species in ecology. The term invasive species is not synonymous with non-native species, which just means that the species was transported by humans from a distant place. To be considered invasive, a human-introduced species has to reproduce, thrive, and spread, thus interfering with native ecologies. Most introduced species do not spread in this way. Invasive species are a small subset of human-introduced species. But I want to push even further against what's become a humanist doxa. The innocence or guilt of intention, whether human or non-human, is not the right question. The focus on the interior state of the soul, human or non-human, gets us only to the Christian roots of post-Enlightenment secularism. Instead, we should be paying attention to the relations between an introduced non-human and the other beings in the landscape patch in which it's been active. It is part, if it's part of a project of conquest, like pasture grasses in Latin America, uh, is it part of that project? Is it a mode of embedding racial hierarchy like industrial toxins in the United States? Does it live well with others like marabou storks in an urban dump? Whether a feral process is deleterious or benign depends entirely on its relationships with others within a landscape patch. Too many humanists ignore material relations entirely in condemning words such as invasive species. Instead, let's look at what's going on in particular places, including among non-humans. Don't get me wrong, what's going on involves people's understandings as well as material relations. I'm not against attention to human language and discourse, which indeed are necessary for us to understand what's going on. I'm speaking against intention as the key mode of assessment for historical action, human or non-human. We didn't mean to is a very sorry excuse. Enough of this. It's time to take you to a new route. What scale is the cosmopolitan city? Now that is actually a nonsense question and on purpose. My goal in posing it that way is to shake up the notion of scale that's still hegemonic, at least in the social sciences. This notion of scale requires us to assume that the small is a microcosm of the large and that smaller scales nest neatly inside larger scales. When the World Bank says, scale up your study, that's what they're talking about. We call this scalability. And it's so easy for us to take this for granted because of the charisma of our computers, which use a zoom function to make the small big without changing a single thing in the relationships involved. Consider the prestige of research that uses big data. Big data works on just this principle since it assumes that numbers taken from one place nest naturally into numbers from other places since the researcher can ignore everything about the relationships that produce those numbers. Scalability is built into understandings of both the big and the data of big data. The whole point of noticing cosmopolitanism in the city is to see differences and ways of working across these differences rather than ignoring difference. Scalability makes no sense as a tool with which to understand the cosmopolitan city. Of course, we need to look at many scales, from tiny animals and drinking water to cross-continental invasions. But we can't assume that they nest in each other, since differences refuse the microcosm to macrocosm zoom. 
Instead of assuming we can ever scale up, we are urged to attend to constitutive relations and to make connections across them without nesting them. I know that's a bit abstract, so let me make it more concrete by talking about the relation between city and countryside. William Cronus, Cronin gave us all a great gift by showing how the transformation of city and countryside are completely intertwined in the making of Chicago. While studies of rural life once imagined it as autonomous, I think that's changed. Most scholars who study the countryside now don't forget the city. But the compliment is, alas, less true. Most scholars of the city ignore the countryside completely. If they're going to look outward, they look towards more powerful cities. They forget how the countryside constitutes the city and vice versa. To move across scales in the cosmopolitan city then, I'm suggesting that we make connections across relational zones. And one of those that's most important is the city and countryside relationship. It's a really important connection with which to think of the non-human denizens of the cosmopolitan city. They often come from the countryside, or they flow out of the city, or they travel back and forth in their feral ways. Let's follow a few to see how they help us consider the scale of cosmopolitanism. Feral beings go in and out of the city, and often that movement changes them. This is why we need to connect patches rather than embedded, embed them in nested scales. Consider this historical riddle. How did yellow fever become an urban disease? Once the mosquitoes that carry yellow fever viruses lived in holes in trees in the forest where they rarely encountered people. What changed? The trade in enslaved Africans shipped to the New World. Anthropologist Paula Ebron has shown how mosquitoes who joined these ships changed, evolving a new kind of mosquito on the Middle Passage. This mosquito was domesticated, that is, dependent on human water sources, and it became dedicated to human blood meals. Historian John McNeil has argued that New World plantations were ideal human ecologies for increasing the populations of this variety of mosquito evolved on slave ships. Mosquitoes raised their young in the water of plantation containers, they took their blood meals from the enslaved workers trapped on the plantation. Soon enough, these mosquitoes came to live mainly in and around human houses. The viruses they carried, including yellow fever, became an urban phenomenon. Later, the mosquito was transported back to port cities in the old world, and now it carries many of the most dangerous viruses, including dengue fever and Zika. Living with human infrastructures changed the mosquito. The city transforms its feral denizens. Urban-born non-humans also flow out of the city, and they too are sometimes transformed in the process. Take post-consumer plastics, discarded in cities, but carried out, of, out on rivers and even in the wind to join the plastic gyres that form continent-like rafts in all our oceans today. Plastic lasts a long time, but it breaks up into smaller pieces, and small pieces dominate ocean gyres. These color fragments floating on the ocean look like food to marine animals, from birds to fish and whales. Artist Chris Jordan has documented what happens when Pacific albatrosses feed their chicks plastic instead of living things. The albatross parents gather food for their young by scooping it from the surface of the water over which they're flying at high speeds. Plastic joins nutritious food and is conveyed to their young. Plastic occupies and weighs down the stomach cavity of the fledglings, holding them to the earth when they try to fly and ultimately leading to their death from hunger. Flowing out of the city, plastic becomes a deadly food. Feral beings form distinctive relationships in landscape patches. Plastic fragments do something different in the ocean than they do in a dump. It's only in the ocean that they form fake food for albatross chicks. This is why we need to attend to the relationality of the patch, 
To understand the social life of plastic, one cannot zoom out across nested scales. Instead, we need to connect city and countryside, each with their distinctive patches and relations. Many feral beings go back and forth between city and countryside. In this process, too, they repeatedly form new relations as they find themselves in new landscape patches with distinctive opportunities and challenges. Consider African swine flu, a disease of pigs, as described by anthropologist Bettina Stutzer. The virus that causes this disease can be transmitted in dead pork flesh as well as living pigs. Throwing away the remnants of a ham sandwich in an urban trash can is a perfectly good way to start a disease transmission chain. One way the transmission can happen is through wild boar. In cities such as Berlin, shown in this photograph, wild boar roam freely in and out of the city. And they're sure to eat discarded ham sandwiches from the trash. Now infected, they might wander into the countryside, where they get in contact with commercial domestic pigs who in turn become infected. Indeed, Stutzer has found that wild boar most commonly travel from city to countryside and back on the smooth surfaces of just those infrastructures humans have devised for this purpose, roads and railroad tracks. Boar move in and out of the city, and thus too, the viruses they carry. The possibilities of varied landscape patches as one moves in and out of the city are intriguing from the perspective of a pathogen. Let's consider the deadly fungus, Candida auris. As reported here by epidemiologist Robert Wallace and political ecologist Alex Liebman, Candida auris was in the news right before the coronavirus <clears throat> pandemic because hospitals all over the world realized they had it clinging to their walls. They couldn't clean it off. Every poison they threw at it was ineffective. After every treatment, it was still there. And it could infect human lungs, especially in vulnerable people like patients in hospitals, causing their deaths. Suddenly, being in the hospital has become even more dangerous than it was before. Now, no one has mentioned this during the COVID pandemic, presumably because we can't afford to scare people away from going to the hospital when they can't breathe. But I'm sure it's still there, lingering on the walls. How did this fungus get so resistant to every treatment? Liebman and Wallace argue persuasively that it developed this ability through surviving the flood of fungicides thrown at it in commercial agribusiness, that is, in the countryside where it lives in the soil. It really wasn't doing much harm there. It was just collateral damage to the pathogenic plant fungi that infect commercial crops. The graph here shows the rise of the use of fungus-killing toxins in 21st century agribusiness. Fungicides are just poured on crops and often in combinations. Any soil fungi that can learn how to stay alive in this onslaught are going to rule, since all the other fungi, beneficial or harmful, have been wiped out. Fungicide-resistant Candida auris emerged from this struggle to survive in soils saturated by fungicides. Then it migrated from the countryside to the city, carrying its new fungicide-resistant superpowers. On the walls of hospitals, it has a new kind of landscape patch and a new and almost infinite source of food to live off of, immune-compromised patients. These examples show how relations within landscape patches matter. You can see how much we would lose if we lumped together numbers of viruses from ham sandwiches and from living wild boar, as if they fit together in a single set. Or fungi in factory fields and fungi on hospital walls. They're living through different patch relations. Asking about the cosmopolitan nature of the city means separating these out across their differences and then connecting them as we work across scales. All of us who use quantitative data need to keep asking, from where does this set of numbers come? Are we missing constitutive relations and moving from this set to that set? It's these questions that allow us to hone our focus on cosmopolitanism as a set of living arrangements. The differences matter, and working across scale means connecting patches across their differences. Let's turn to my third and final route. 
in the more than human cosmopolitan city, complete with its connections between city and countryside, who are the subjects of history? So far, I've spoken as if we could keep humans and non-humans separate. I've discussed humans in their relations with cattle and grass, with disease-carrying mosquitoes, with garbage-eating marabou storks, and more. But humans are non-humans are also inside us, making us who we are. The subjects of history can no longer be humans outside of our connections with the feral world. Let me jump to an example. I've mentioned plastic filling the stomachs of albatross chicks, but I haven't yet delved into the ways that animal stomachs, human and non-human, can dissolve components of plastic, bringing their chemicals inside our metabolic systems. To appreciate the weight of this, let's visit the Indian city of Karnataka, where geographer Kelsey Nagy studied free-ranging urban cows. People in Karnataka love cows, and they love milk. These cows are the basis of a local dairy industry. Karnataka re residents prefer the local milk, which they believe to be healthier than that transported into the city. These cows are certainly cosmopolitan denizens of the city. Although each has a home and an owner, they roam around freely all day, and sometimes even total strangers offer them something to eat. In the meantime, they look for their own food. Where do they find it? Nagy found that cows in the city prefer to eat garbage, even when fresh green grass is available. There are more concentrated sugars and proteins in the garbage, and they go straight for it. But much of that attractive food has been discarded in plastic bags, and cows don't have hands to open the bags to remove the food. So they just eat it, plastic and all. Nagy documents how cow stomachs are able to break down components in the plastic and how they concentrate some of the most toxic elements in their milk. Humans, in turn, drink the milk, absorbing already ready-to-digest plastic toxins. As Nagy puts it, Plastics saturate us inside and out. I couldn't help pun on the name of a predatory commercial chain in the United States, Toys Are Us. Along with toys, plastics are us. Non-human living beings are also part of us. Many of us have become aware over the last year of the fact that we can't go anywhere without carrying coronaviruses that coat our nasal passages and mouths, whether or not we feel sick, and perhaps too, whether or not we are vaccinated. Every time we speak, we pour them out across the room, spreading deadly propagules to coat someone else's nose and mouth, perhaps someone more vulnerable than we are. That's why we're meeting on a computer screen. We can't risk allowing our viruses to mingle with each other. We are living assemblages of humans and coronaviruses, not to speak of a whole lot of other bacteria and fungi, beneficial and otherwise. Our assembled multi-species nature changes the way we participate in the cosmopolitan nature of the city. Consider the propensity of viruses to form new variants when they mingle and to cross over to different hosts. In Feral Atlas, biologist Scott Gilbert has written about coronaviruses as elements of holobionts, that is, units of ecology and evolution that involve more than one species. Close relatives of the COVID-19 viruses were once part of the holobiont assemblage of bats. Perhaps pangolin viruses played some part. By mixing a bit of DNA from here and a bit from there, a common habit among viruses, a coronavirus was formed that was ready to infect humans. And of course, we provided that coronavirus with a set of modes of crowding and traveling that made sure that it's been transmitted around the world over the last year and a half, and indeed that it's producing more and more variants. Gilbert's account of COVID coronaviruses is vivid because he shows them in relation to other holobiont clusters that have been moving around due to human action. A soybean bug has become resistant to pesticides, not from its own prowess, but because it carries a helpful kind of bacteria that converts insecticides to food. The North American red turpentine beetle, which lives on pine trees, has through its industrial travels to China, 
found a symbiotic fungus that turns it into a tree killer sent back to the United States. It's wreaking havoc on trees. COVID's coronavirus is only one more example of such changing symbiotic relations, which flourish through worldwide industrial transport, as well as the flow of feral beings between city and countryside. Let me play with the concept of holobiont, which Gilbert introduced. The holobiont is an assemblage that evolves together. This is a new concept. Until rather recently, biologists thought of each species as an autonomous evolutionary unit. Other species were either competitors, predators, or prey. In recent years, however, and in part because of Gilbert's own research, biologists recognized that most species need other species to become themselves. Many insects, for example, need special kinds of bacteria to make it possible for their reproductive systems to mature. We humans need different kinds of bacteria to be able to digest our food. These interspecies arrangements tell the lie to the idea that each species evolves autonomously. The concept of the holobiont was developed to acknowledge the importance of multi-species interactions in every species process of becoming. Gilbert refers us to lichens, assemblages of algae and fungi that only live because of their cross-species interaction. As Gilbert explains, we are all lichens now. We are all holobionts. In the same way, history is not made by individual actors or even homogeneous social groups acting together. Interactions across difference, including species difference and even difference between living and non-living beings, are essential to how historical action develops. The actors that make any historical event possible are always already more than human assemblages. We might need to be talking about historical holo actors, assemblages that make history in their joint actions, yet across difference. Working as an assemblage can change our actions. Coronavirus caring humans are an example. Everyone in this meeting has likely changed their behavior because of the knowledge that they're likely to be a human virus assemblage. If you haven't gone to visit your mother or to take your friends out to dinner or to a big rowdy party, it's because you're aware of your probable status as a human virus assemblage. And if it's changed your actions as an individual, even more so the patterns of sociality more generally. We hear of lions roaming golf courses in South Africa and whales a little more free to sing to each other in the Arctic because of the slowdown of human activity. If there was ever a time to think through historical action by human holobionts, this is it. But our multi-species nature is not enough. Historical holo actors need to include the constitutive relations of the landscape patch. Those relations make history because they create the more than human players in relation to each other. They create the terms in which historical action is possible. Let me explain through a concrete example. Argentine ants act differently in California cities versus forests, and not because their biology changes, but because they have different affordances to work with. To include them in our histories requires drawing in the characteristics of these language patch variants. Argentine ants spread from Argentina in the 19th century on sugar shipping route, sea routes to arrive in Europe and North America. In California, where I live, they become an annoying pest in every household swarming through the house every time it rains. They have multiple queens and they respond to ant poison by just making new colonies. In other words, ant poison increases their population. That's one reason they've taken over from just about every kind of California native ant, at least in people's houses. The other reason is that they love the water and food resources of the city, as well as the suburbs. They're one of those species drawn to the city and thriving within it. Biologist Deborah Gordon began her research on these ants with this kind of prejudice. The Argentine ants are taking over. But when she carefully studied the spread of these ants in a California nature reserve, she found that some species of native ants were able to fight back and hold their own territories. That's why she writes in Feral Atlas, the effect of an invasive species is not constant. 
The Argentine ants in the forest were not very successful in taking over. In contrast, in California cities, Argentine ants have replaced most native ant species. The reason? People have built an urban infrastructure that is perfect for these ants. Argentine ants become historical actors through the resources and allies of their landscape patch. In the city, they have aptitudes that other ants cannot match, and that's what makes them so powerful. As you think back to all the reports I've described, you see this feature. Feral entities gain their historical agency through their relations with some aspect or another of the human-built landscape. Wild boar travel on railroad tracks, yellow fever carrying mosquitoes make use of human water sources and blood meals. Rats reproduce in colonial sewer systems. It's impossible to see these non-humans as historical actors without including their relations with human transformed landscape patches. The same is true for humans as historical actors. We are nothing without the landscape relations with which we falter or thrive. We've been taught across the humanistic disciplines to ignore non-humans or to imagine them only as resources for human actions. Humans are exceptional, we are told. We have consciousness and intention. Everything else in the world is mechanical and therefore irrelevant to making history, so they tell us. This is wrong. Only by embracing our entanglement in the more than human world can we have any sense of the world rising around us. Those great continent crossing invasions, they were all more than human invasions with non-human troops alongside human ones. Just look at the pasture grasses of Latin America to be reminded how central the invasion of cows and grasses has been to the displacement of indigenous communities, human and non-human. The history of capitalism, certainly a more than human history in which plantations and factories are among the landscape patches and patterns condensed in human bodies and actions. As for post-World War II history, it cannot be told without radioactivity and toxic wastes, which permeate our bodies as well as the land and water around us. Contaminants are us these days, and the histories of our times are chemically challenged. Historical holo actors condense the architecture of a landscape assemblage. Let me return briefly to Jacob Doherty's Marabou Storks in Kampala, Uganda. Here's the map Doherty drew to explain the storks' occupation of the city. That yellow-green patch in the center is the high ground where elites live and storks roost. Around this is low ground. The top orange blob is a waste dump and a stork feeding ground. All through the city, waste flows from the elite high ground to the surrounding low swamps. And those latter spaces are where both salvagers and storks find their livelihoods. The stork occupation of the city encapsulates both topography and class stratification. Landscape architecture is a key uh, component of this more than human history. Sometimes feral beings carry such architecture inside their bodies as they move from the countryside to the city. Historian Kate Brown writes of commercial blueberry picking in the Chernobyl exclusion zone. Brown writes, long before Chernobyl's fourth reactor blew, scientists understood that Polesian swampland with its dense tangle of bogs, streams, lakes, and quagmire was very good at recirculating radio radioactive isotopes and channeling them towards mineral-starved plants, which hungrily drank up isotopes that mimicked minerals needed for survival. Berries and mushrooms are classic forest products because they take what they can from the poor forest ground. That's the end of the quote. Radioactive berries are shipped to cities, forming the bulk of the frozen wild blueberry trade in Europe and beyond. They carry with them the architecture of nutrient-poor bogs and radioactive isotopes condensed in their blueberry bodies, and of course in ours as we eat them. They condense landscape patterns in themselves. These landscape patterns make them historical holo actors. What if landscape patches and patterns, whether inside or outside of bodies, 
or history-making units for the more than human cosmopolitan city. I'll admit I found myself rather startled to arrive my, to my, myself at this resting place. It seems a bit bold and I'm not sure it's right. But still, I see how I got here from one stepping stone to another. And perhaps it's a useful provocation with which to end. However, I hope it's not the only idea you got from this journey. Please do look back at the places we visited along the way, from what's in the water you drink to where your plastic trash goes. Donna Haraway has written about the nourishing features of indigestion as one consumes stories across radical differences. I hope that taken as a whole, our small excursion offers nourishing, if sometimes difficult to digest, food for discussion of the histories we need of the more than human cosmopolitan city. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. This was wonderful. Um, such an inspiring and exciting project and such an inspiring um, talk uh, based on the project. Um, I'm, of course, um, thinking a lot of things uh, very dear to my own research, my own um, thoughts on the city and cosmopolitanism and the non-human presence uh, in between. Um, I'm also uh, very much inspired by how you have used this keynote uh, as a more than keynote lecture, if you will, kind of a more than human uh, way. All these scholars, all these researchers are brought in um, through your talk and of course through your, through your scholarship, you form alliances, assemblages through your scholarship, which is, I think, very inspirational um, for all scholars. Uh, so thank you so much. This has been really, really great. Um, I have my own questions, but I would also like to um, invite all the audience uh, to um, ask their questions. They can write them as comments. They can also put down their questions in the ask the question bar uh, beneath our videos. There are all these uploads coming uh, from the audience. I think uh, the audience as well has very much enjoyed this. Uh, so one, the, the first question I would like to address is actually uh, has come from an audience member. Uh, I wanted to ask this as well. So let's start with Sarah. Um, Daphne asks, how was Feral Atlas born? What has been key takeaways uh, for Anna in, uh, or from Anna in helping build this platform? And I can actually add to this question, um, thinking, can you, can you take us through this collaborative nature of your work? And th that has been the case for a long time. This is not the first time you are doing such a thing, uh, especially collaborating with natural scientists, which uh, is, it, it has its challenges and probably many of us working in humanities and social sciences, we have our own um, concerns of, for such collaboration. So can you walk through this project as well as a larger nature of your collaborative uh, work? Well, both the project and some of the uh, larger work uh, were born from the opportunity I gained uh, from a grant to work in Denmark with a group that was called Aarhus University Research on the Anthropocene or Aura between 2013 and 2018. And uh, they, I think in part um, the generous thinking of the grantors to allow us to try some experiments rather than forcing us to just produce research data without thinking about it, allowed some of these experiments to unfold, including Feral Atlas. And uh, perhaps also, and I mean, because so, some of these might be relevant in Turkey as well, that being in a comparatively small country compared to the United States meant that it was easier to work across disciplines in some way than in the United States where 
the silos between the humanities and the natural sciences are so deeply entrenched that it's very hard to get people to talk to you across those silos. So I think uh, being in Denmark was useful for, for getting a ball rolling, perhaps, of uh, trying to figure out in a slower way how to make some of these collaborations. And also the, the insight that we started with is instead of starting with like the philosophy of science on the one hand or big science on the other, we might start with what we were thinking of as field-based curiosity, that natural scientists, especially like a field biologist or field geologist or chemist, they're out there, they want to know what's going on. And similarly, historians, anthropologists, a lot of people coming from the humanity side also want to describe what's going out there in the world. So we were going to use that common interest in what's going on as a new kind of collaboration that seemed uh, promising in very different ways, especially if we want to understand environmental history, where we've got to understand how the non-human trajectories and the human trajectories working together. Feral Atlas itself uh, kind of worked through bundles of contingencies. It was first going to be just a, like a little reporting project on the Aura team itself. And then uh, when I was talking about it, everywhere I went and mentioned it, people would say, I've got a Feral Atlas a report for you. I want to tell you about this. And they just started to, to accumulate on top of each other. We never had a call for papers because I never realized that it was going to be a big thing. You know, it was going to be just like a group of friends. And then all these other people volunteered to join. And before you knew it, we had this giant thing going involving all kinds of skills that I didn't have with uh, software development and things like that. And if we hadn't had to give it in to Stanford University Press uh, a little more than a year ago, uh, it'd probably be twice as big, um, just through volunteers. So I think in a, that way, I feel like it touched a nerve in a good sense of the term that people thought, yes, we have feral stories. And, and it's certainly one of our goals as a project uh, to get people to think of the world around them and to think about all the kinds of feral uh, dynamics that all of us live with every day. Thank you. Um, in order to prevent echo, I turn off Anna's mic first and then turn on mine. So that's why you have that delay in between. Uh, I would, I mean, recommend all of our audience to uh, check it out right away. Uh, the Feral Atlas. Uh, I put the link beneath uh, our video so you can go, go directly there. I mean, this entire um, perspective and the collaboration is so impressive, but also it's so beautifully designed. It's like you can spend hours and days uh, just exploring different drawers and different um, routes. Um, it's really a fascinating project. So. Um, well, thanks to the grantors and, of course, thanks to your collaborators as well for uh, working with you for such a such a wonderful project. Uh, so let me go to the other questions. Um, there is uh, one question that I would like to um, address that it comes from Aslı Odman, I think. Um, sorry, I, I've lost it. There are all these questions coming now yes okay um so she asks um she says thank you for this inspiring research agenda of commodity chains interconnectedness between scales and species all the cases you exemplified contain true um, hashtag corporate crimes where to place corporate agency in your research agenda uh Corporate crime is, oh, am I on? Okay, uh, I, I think that's a very good question and that we really need to look at the history and workings of, of capitalism to understand uh, why we're in such environmental trouble these days. And that I hope, you know, and it won't change without a lot of public outcry uh, to ask for some uh, very fundamental kinds of changes. So. Just at the level of Feral Atlas, uh, 
we have imagined this project to address what we call imperial and industrial infrastructures. But if you look at the kind of industrial infrastructures uh, that we're looking at, they're mostly tied to the history of capitalism, the commodification of the earth, and the uh, externalization of all of the kinds of destruction uh, that are out there uh, that we allow corporations. So it seems to me uh, absolutely essential that we stop accepting the business as usual rules of capitalism and demand that uh, some of the kinds of, of taken for granted of property and profit are not allowed to rule in the way they are. I mean, in, in North America, uh, one of the reasons that indigenous people have been at the forefront, for example, of uh, climate change uh, and uh, oil, um, oil and gas fossil fuel uh, objection movements is because they are the only folks who, as part of the treaty system, have a leg to stand on outside of thinking through private property. But uh, so we need to open up other ways of, of organizing ourselves. Um, so corporate crime, absolutely. Thank you so much. Um, uh, so there are a lot of questions coming. Uh, I'm trying to navigate them. Uh, so this one question um, asks, says, I was struck by how the pyramidal figures that you propose navigated not only the connections of human and more than human assemblages, but also the distinctive, sorry, disjunctive relations between them, the rift inequalities between urban and rural, between rich and poor, and so forth. Uh, I know also in your previous work, you've been very attentive to how capital exploits such distinctive, disjunctive relations. I was wondering whether there's some kind of lesson we can draw from these feral figures. Uh oh, that's pretty open ended at the end of the question there. Um, so I don't know what direction to go in answering. Maybe somebody can help me. What? Because of course, of course, there's lots of lessons, but I don't know which one the questioner would like, which direction the questioner would like me to address. Uh, can you help me a little think about what kind of... So I'm... So I'm, 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 I'm sorry, yes. Uh, I'm assuming that um, there, I mean, that perhaps uh, there is some lesson to draw from how um, from these field figures in terms of uh, the explo exploitative relations that we are engaged among each other as well as with uh, the non-human. So perhaps th that's what I'm assuming, uh, the way field figures uh, attach to each other, to others, uh, can bring some lessons uh, in terms of the way we associate with uh, non-human world outside us. But that's what I'm assuming. Okay, so two lessons. One is just that environmental justice is so important that we should never uh, kind of mobilize and organize around the environment without thinking about questions of environmental justice. So that seems to me uh, just a beginning place. And the second is that, you know, some of the most powerful elites claim that they're addressing uh, environmental problems through forms of green capitalism and uh, giant geoengineering projects. And that uh, oh, the whole point of Feral Atlas is it, infrastructures like that have feral effects. And sometimes the bigger the infrastructural project, the bigger the feral effects. I mean, you know, 
that we live in a time, modernization you could call it, in which we're asked to believe that everything that the designer of a project says the project will do is all it will do. That we don't have to think beyond the kind of ideological proclamation of the designers of a project. And we've, we've been asked to live in that faith. That faith is not doing us any good right now, that we're in deep trouble because of it. So that all of those infrastructural projects that the green capitalists are putting forward, the very first thing to ask about them is what kinds of feral effects are, are going to be created from them. And that the kind of irresponsibility with which transformation projects have been allowed from corporations and governments and armies, that these irresponsible projects, you know, are making it very difficult for life to continue in, a, in the ways that we would like it to. Uh, so th I think that's the big uh, takeaway from, from the Feral Atlas is if we're going to do earth transforming projects, we cannot believe the designers of those projects as to what actually they'll be producing. They'll be producing a whole lot of other things too, and we better start paying attention to them. Thank you, um, Anna. I hope this has uh, answered uh, our um, audience, audience members uh, question. Uh, so let me go to other um, questions. Okay, um, there's a question from Sarah. Having the processes you describe, human, non human assemblages, cosmopolitan cities. Sorry, I lost it. Uh, and behavior. Uh, as assemblages actors move between urban and rural, uh, haven't they always existed? Have they qualitatively changed in the modern era of capitalist ruins, or is this just the latest iteration of a timeless phenomenon? Uh, thanks for that question. I Because I do think, of course, humans, just like other species, have affected the world around us since the origin of our species. But I think that uh, clear uh, changes have happened, and not just once, but in multiple occasions. In, in Feral Atlas, we call these Anthropocene detonators, that is, historical conjunctures of kinds of infrastructure programs that uh, make it very difficult to uh, resume life the way it was before. Uh, and, you know, like the most recent of them, you know, which we associate in part with the Great Acceleration, for example, the period after World War II, is the introduction of radioactivity and very potent kinds of toxins that we didn't have before that completely change the possibilities of life that we have to live with those kinds of contaminants all the time. That's just one example. So we also have started 500 years ago with the kind of continent shifting uh, flora and fauna that was part of European expansion into the New World and then later into the Pacific. Uh, it, that we also talk about empire in which we're thinking of the great European colonial projects in Asia and Africa and Latin America. We talk about capitalism, which through the ways that it commodified the earth, uh, again, changed what was possible. It did not wipe out pockets of what my colleague Zachary Capel calls Holocene fragments. I think we are lucky that we are living with lots of Holocene fragments. On the other hand, these historical conjunctures, these detonators, ushered in a new kind of situation for uh, living together. It, it doesn't mean that we should naturalize it and therefore think, okay, it's a done deal, but we should also recognize the ways that um, these these uh, historical conjunctures made a big difference in what humans could be on Earth. Thank you, Anna. Um, let me um, ask one of my questions. Uh, if you allow me to bring my own personal agenda to uh, here, um, so 
cosmopolitanism as a concept is perhaps one of the most loaded terms and loaded with all the assumptions that you criticize uh, in humanities uh, words that we use. Uh, it's very much based on language, ba very much based on uh, multi multiplicity of languages, um and so it's really it really carries all these all these different uh baggages of uh perhaps what was problematic with uh humanities humanistic research uh until very recently so um do you think is, is that it's possible to save the world uh and open it to these larger assemblages more than human uh, is it possible to have more than human cosmopolitanism? Is it is it still not too late to save the world itself? Well, I have had to think about that a lot in the last couple of weeks as I was working on this paper because when I wrote the abstract for you, I felt this without I hadn't thought about it very clearly, and I felt this little delight that I might be able to uh, be vaguely useful to a conference on the history of Istanbul. And uh, then when I had to sit down to work on the paper, I worried intensely that, first of all, that the term cosmopolitanism has a well-defined meaning and humanists have been going over it. And I went back to some of the key books on cosmopolitanism. And I thought, this is not what I care about at all. So you heard that little kind of uh, caveat at the beginning. Uh, where, you know, all everybody wants to talk about cosmopolitanism and nationalism and all of those kinds of uh, distinctions. But there's a, I, I guess, I think it still has possibilities to, as, as I tried to define it as a set of urban living arrangements uh, that has a quality that we care about, which is working across difference. And that it's in the, that capacity that maybe stretching the word is still possible. And I guess in general, my, my own uh, policy about words is to try and stretch them rather than to give up on them. That, that if we gave up on words, we pretty soon not have be able to speak to each other at all in terms of the kinds of baggage they carry. So I think we've got a chance and you know, reading through the program of this uh, conference, it's really a conference about a cosmopolitan Istanbul with more than humans in it. And that seems super exciting to me. Um, thank you. And this is great to hear that you, uh, I mean, the conference program itself has inspired uh, the way you are approaching the question of cosmopolitanism and non humans, uh, which inspired back uh, for me to re-think uh, uh, what I feel about the, 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 this word. Um, so I have, so the, a cool feature of Crowdcast is that there is a, uh, there's some democracy in the way uh, questions are uh, raised. Uh, people can vote uh, questions. Uh, so the, the question that has, a lot of votes um, comes from Eyüp Fidan Akıncı, uh, who says, "Our entanglement with the non-human world is amazing, but might get paralyzing too. How to devise policy, especially deal, especially when dealing with an authoritarian political structure, uh, which is true for not only for here but for a lot of uh, different places in the world right now." If I'm understanding the question correctly, it's one of those questions that says, is this a time when we can't afford to pay attention to non-humans? And, you know, for those of you that have been around the academy before, we hear this all the time about gender, about race and ethnicity, that maybe we're in a time where we can't afford to pay attention to those differences. And I think in general, should I go ahead? Um, yeah, sorry, just to uh, give a little nuance. I, I mean, she she doesn't say necessarily that we can't afford, but 
perhaps uh, wants to hear some strategies uh, to um, do that, to afford that, to be being able to afford that while living in these times. Okay, thank you. That's very helpful because I do I do think uh, and I mean and I think the work I was trying to do in the talk about differentiating between uh, potential allies and potential blockers on living together is exactly the strategy that I'd want to do because when we're working on human social issues, which I care about a lot, uh, we need to pull in the, the non-human allies, they're going to help us uh, uh, to mobilize it and that, that, that stuff where I was playing at the end about landscape patches, uh, I mean that, how do I, how do I put it that, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think of a good historical example. Um, that perhaps uh, in Southeast Asia, uh, people uh, ha who, who are, are fighting against authoritarian states have often found forests and mountains to be places of refuge. So they're using the possibilities of um, that landscape patch for an emancipatory kind of mobilization. Uh, that's just a, a small example of how we need to draw in the allies, or actually an even clearer thing that during um, the US-Indochina war, uh, people hid in these kind of swampy places where the American soldiers couldn't find them. Uh, so the, the affordances of landscape patches, both in the city and in the countryside, are those that we need to be able to tap. And so having a sense of who our uh, allies are and who is getting in our way. I mean, I think maybe the simple way with even out getting into politics, when we think about what we've been learning about COVID and how, what kinds of gatherings we cannot do at this point until we've, you know, figured out a way to get beyond this particular virus that, that we can't have the kinds of, of uh, politics that we had before. And I mean, there's a beautiful entry in, in um, uh, Feral Atlas uh, called Letter from Beirut, where a Lebanese feminist writer tries to think about what kinds of politics are possible in the COVID epidemic and how our lives as political actors on every level depend on, you know, a variety of things that involve this virus. So I think uh, we need to be paying attention uh, to these environmental things. And I also think in a place like the United States, uh, that where questions of racial capitalism have really come to the fore with the Black Lives Matter movement, that we need an environmental justice movement it's really at the heart of this. We need to build that across what's been an environmental movement and a um, racial justice movement that at that intersection is one of the most powerful organizing tools to fight back against uh, some of the biggest problems we have today. Thank you so much. Um, and I think that's true for Turkey as well, where um, the ecological movement uh, has shown us the ways in which uh, urban and rural communities are actually uh, how their livelihoods, how their lives depend on each other, but also how several injustices are connected to ecological um, injustices, environmental uh, questions as well. So I think um, living under authoritarian regimes should motivate motivate us to even think more critically about these entanglements and to um, um, as you say uh, build up alliances with the non-human uh, world um, so this is done uh, so from 
a historian to an anthropologist who thinks historically and works with historians. Um, Adam asks, when the number of actors that take part in this history is so immense, how does a historian uh, deal with it? Um, you can answer this the way you want, uh, either suggesting different ways to people from other disciplines or from your own experience. It, you, you saw the exploratory place where I found myself, which is, and, and you know, I'm, I'm working on this last few days, so I felt bad that I'm not sure I want to go there. But I ended up with these landscape patterns and patches as my holo units of historical analysis. So rather than trying to bring in an assemblage that has everything in it, I wanted to start with uh, landscape patterns and patches and relations across them, you know, the different ones, in that if you, um, uh, in the, it, well, I mean, actually, you know, to try with the, the Mayor Bustorks um, example that I gave, that there, it's realizing that the rich people live on the hill and the poor people live in the wetlands around them, uh, and that's where the garbage is, is flowing too, is it's some way that in that, you know, that it seemed to me that that set of assemblages tells you something about historical action in that city that you need to know. So that's what I'm trying right now, is to pull those pieces together. Um, but. I'm looking for comments from you guys too about how to do this better because precisely you can't pull in everything, but uh, uh, within, I mean, again, rather than pushing scales out in that scalability way to hold on to, to particular places and their connections with other places seems to me really useful. And then you only have that set of assemblages that happens to be constitute this particular place. So at least that's a, a starting way that I'm trying to think about this problem. But looking for your... Thank you. And I think another obvious answer would be collaborations, right? Uh, like the, the, the way you work, and I think the way we all should uh try in different ways perhaps not in this scale but still in our uh more um well in, in our way uh collaborating and bringing different people to ask different questions and uh, locate different agencies i think that's another uh way to approach this uh at least that's what i gather from your work uh so let's so I, I'll uh, have an, a few other questions. I think we still have some time. Session would normally end at 8.30 in Istanbul time, but uh, I think we can uh, have another 10 minutes because we started late. Um, but let me find those questions. Uh, so, Aishan asks, um, a piece of Feral Atlas project was here in Istanbul at Istanbul Modern Museum a couple of years ago as part of the Istanbul Biennale. Did you know that? Um, and, uh, sorry, did you know that? I found it as an art project very inspirational and mind-opening uh, as I found your talk today. So this connection between science and art is valuable. Uh, I was assuming that you knew about this, but I still wanted to uh, utter it because that's what I found out uh, preparing for this conference um, and working with my colleagues at Para Museum, curators, uh, and the artists that they work with, how excited they were to uh, hear about your presence in the uh, conference and 
really, I mean, looking at their work, looking at the videos that they prepared for the conference that we will screen in these next three days, how influential um, your work probably, I mean, and for some of them, perhaps the BNL exhibition was the, the first encounter uh, for me as well. Uh, so um, I just wanted to um, say that. And if you want to say anything, please go ahead. Please go ahead. Well, first, uh, thanks. And uh, it's a great moment to talk about collaboration because uh, the time that we were preparing for the Biennale was also an incredibly crazy time for getting texts together. And so it was only through the amazing generosity of having these collaborators, all of us who were kind of working as hard as we could on this project, that something like that could happen, that we could actually have this big exhibit while we were racing to try and put together the digital project at the same time. So I will say humbly that I did not have a lot to do with the uh, the way that the exhibit was put together. I was there in all our group meetings, but others very kindly uh, took the leadership in figuring out how to display. And I was just so grateful and still, you know, jazzed by the fact that we had this chance to display in Istanbul, which I, I just think was incredible. Uh, really an amazing opportunity to get to do that. So uh, would be, yeah, just, just full of gratitude about that opportunity. Thank you, Anna. Um, while I'm looking at the questions, I also wanted to uh, say something um, that Oslo Odman um, mentioned. She is the person who asked about cap capitalist, um, corp sorry, corporate crimes. Uh, so she shared with us, and I will send you the link to um, another atlas, um, which is called Environmental Justice Atlas, uh, which and Turkey is part of it. So I think it um, it would they would those two atlases would speak to each other in a fruitful way and bring these different perspectives together. So I will send you that, and thank you also for mentioning that. Um, Okay, um, the, the question that I want to um, raise comes from Gözde, and she says, the art of storytelling is really powerful and inspiring in your writing. Could you share some of the work that moves you as a researcher? Uh, well, what a, um, I mean, let me say that I love to read environmental history. I should say that because, you know, if I have a chance to like pick out some books at a display, the thing that uh, really uh, comes to mind as something I'm going to love is often environmental history. So uh, I don't know if I want to pull out particular um, historians, but uh, that's an incredibly important inspiration to me. Um, also, um, things that come from fiction are, are a part of my um, repertoire of learning how to write. I think uh, I have been influenced, for example, by uh, Ursula Le Guin as a writer uh, because she writes both her essays and her um, fiction work uh, brings us into how to create new worlds. Other science fiction writers uh, like Octavia Butler or um, A.K. Jemison are also, you know, expanding our imaginations about how to think about human, non-human relationships with each other. In terms of academics, um, well, I, I really do want to uh, put a 
kudo out to Donna Haraway, who I have really learned a lot from throughout my career. Um, that's been a, such an important influence uh, for me. In terms of storytelling, I don't know. You know, it's like I almost would want to have the chance to prepare to think about who to throw out good wishes to. But I, I mean, even within the Feral Atlas team, watching people uh, bring in different kinds of storytelling techniques across the disciplines, it was really, really exciting to me. I'm uh, Jennifer Dager, who's one of my collaborators, and I used to be a journalist, uh, introduced this idea, which we called a thought bomb, which was to have a, a uh, title that condenses the most uh, the most vivid point of the essay in the title. And I've been really impressed at how that has drawn people into the Atlas to have these sentence style titles. So I've learned a lot in making the Atlas from my uh, collaborators. Thank you. And thanks also for the uh, shout out to um, the environmental historians. Uh, so the environmental history community represented here in the conference would be very happy to hear that. Um, and uh, I, I agree with, uh, I, I think it was good there, uh, that your writing is uh, really powerful and um, all the names that you mentioned, I think are also very inspiring figures that um, it, the connection is very, very much there. Uh, so this might be the last question. Uh, it was also in my list and someone uh, asked, someone else has asked it as well. Um, hmm, okay, so uh, the question is on the COVID vaccine or um, in the shadow of COVID vaccine injustice, how do you see the future possibilities of collective problem solving and collective action against the environmental crisis? Um, I will add to this, um, not only collective problem solving, but also the future of environmental humanities itself. How do you think um, if it's that's even possible in a COVID, post-COVID world, uh, how do you, what do you think about the future of environmental humanities, but also environmental uh, policy making and um, collective decision making, as uh, our audience member uh, has put it? Well, one way to answer the question is the contradiction between the future for environmental humanities, which seems to me incredibly promising precisely because the direction of the world is looking really bad. Um, that there's going to be a lot for us to write about. And I mean, that's a kind of terrible thing to have to say, but uh, in terms of the uh, vaccine uh, in inequalities, for example, it's, it's just only one, I mean, talk about corporate crimes right there. It, I don't want to go on a rant, but there's so much that makes me angry about how uh, the structure of giant corporations has just been bowed to by governments and policymakers all around the world to create, uh, to, to further uh, create injustices that even ones that weren't there before. And the, the eagerness to embrace a kind of business as usual capitalism as soon as people can get out is, it's terrifying in my opinion. It's really terrifying. So the future, the immediate future, even should in an imaginary world, a lot of people get vaccinated. Uh, as long as nobody's addressing the problems that create these kinds of pandemics, let's say magically COVID disappeared overnight. Well, we would have another one within the next few years because of the world that we have created that uh, creates these kinds of, of uh, shooting around the world 
just to create the supply chains of every single commodity that we buy and that we use. So there's a big challenge for those of us in environmental humanities. And the, to try and return to the good part of it is we have our work cut out for us. We have a lot to address. And I think the kind of stuff that this conference is working on and how to bring environmental humanities to the heart of uh, explorations of the city is really exciting because not just in Istanbul, but everywhere, it hasn't been done as fully as it needs to be done. And uh, I can't wait to see what you come up with. And let me say, uh, back to my own provisionalness, I'm interested in comments about whether, because I, I can't decide now about whether this concept of cosmopolitanism is going to get us anywhere as in, in a um, more than human world, or if there's other ways of doing that work that are better. Thank you, Anna. Um, well, I think it's definitely useful uh, in just the way that it shows how uh, human focused the concept was. So even just to lay out that that bare fact is, is I think very important, but also it's, as you say, stretching the concept and the way our think about the way uh, we think about difference and diversity and otherness, um, I think that that's very fruitful um, to uh, think about. So I think we are now over time. Um, this has been wonderful. Uh, the, the lecture was amazing. Uh, I hope the questions um, were uh, good for you as well. I learned a lot. Uh, with, from the discussion that's going on in the chat panel, there are all these different links and uh, sources uh, just flowing in, uh, which I think shows that this, the entire discussion has been very inspiring for uh, everyone. Um, so thank you so much. If you want to uh, say or add anything, please, more than, you're more than welcome. Uh, otherwise, we were, we've been very grateful that you were with us for this. Well, I just want to say thank you to the whole audience. I can tell there's a lot going on in the chat. I hope you'll make a copy of, of what's in the chat so I can enjoy it at leisure. And I look forward to hearing from uh, all of you as the conference uh, proceeds. So thank you. Thank you so much. I, we will definitely uh, export the entire chat uh, for you, but also for our conference audience we will put it in discord that's why we are using that platform uh so to advertise uh, our platform and um thank you to all the members of the audience as well uh, this has been really great thank you for the amazing questions and comments uh, and also for bearing with us during the initial technical difficulties thank you again uh, anna and see you tomorrow uh, in the first session of day two Bye.